I mentioned before our break, uh, uh, we do have a session this uh, for this AGM on the history of business and philanthropy. And our moderator is uh, none other than Mark Bonham. Not only is Mark our secretary treasurer and a driving force uh, for pushing forward business history in Canada, but Mark is an author, a business leader himself, and a significant philanthropist as well. In 2017, Mark was named by the Financial Times of London as an outstanding global LGBTQ business leader. And his philanthropic work includes uh, numerous fundraising campaigns, including as co-chair for the Casey House Hospital Capital Campaign, chair of the Toronto Botanical Garden Annual Campaign, and as benefactor of the Mark Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies at the University of Toronto. Among other endeavors, Mark is also responsible for the Bonham Scholarship and the Bonham Chair in International Finance at the Rotman School at the U of T. In 2018, Mark was named the Outstanding Philanthropist of the Year by the Association of Fundraising Professionals in Canada. So I think he's especially well suited to moderate our session today. Uh, Mark, please go ahead and thank you. Well, thank you, Dimitri. That's a very kind introduction. I appreciate it very much. Um, welcome everyone to the second half of the Canadian Business History Association's annual general meeting, where we present a panel discussion on the history of business and philanthropy. This discussion is, of course, very relevant to us today, given the tremendous boost to the CBHA ACHA from the recent generous endowment we have received from the Wilson Foundation. And indeed, that uh, led us to selecting this particular topic for this year's AGM. Before we begin, I want to make a particular thank you to the sponsor of our series and this particular talk, which is National Bank Financial. They've been with us right from the beginning, and we appreciate it very much. And National Bank, of course, is also a member of the organization. So thank you, National Bank Financial. So just a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, I ask that everyone today, again, keep your microphones and video cameras off with the exception of the panelists. This will ensure we have sufficient bandwidth and no technical interruptions during the presentation. We, of course, welcome questions from the audience at any time throughout the presentation. Uh, while a presentation is being made, just submit your question using the chat function located the, at the bottom of your screen. Um, but once the talk is over, we can open the floor to the type of discussions we have recently had. Of course, the benefit of this type of talk is getting interaction between the, the speakers and the audience and among the speakers as well. So we want to try to encourage that as best we can in, in this technological world. <laughs> uh, I, I will moderate those questions and pose them to the panelists throughout the presentation if you use the chat function. So with that behind us, let's uh, begin our presentation. I'll, I'll give a few words and then introduce our, our panelists today. Well, the relationship between philanthropy and business has a very long history uh, to allow us to observe, interpret, and comment on. It is generally understood that the prime function of any business enterprise is to generate profits. The idea that business owners should also seek to perform social tasks is re regarded as an ancillary activity. Historical evidence suggests that not all business leaders or organizations have been content simply to perform a commercial role in society. There has always been this push-pull relationship between business and philanthropy. Numerous industrialists and entrepreneurs throughout the 19th and 20th century made significant contributions to their local communities. The early efforts of socially responsible business leaders and companies are well documented. I mean, for entertainment, think of the Charles Dickens novels for a start. Without a doubt, the character of corporate philanthropy has continued to evolve since the 19th century, along with changes in industry, society, and the economy. From public service-minded business owners giving to church charities and pet projects, and here in Canada, I think of the Goodrums, George Cox, or Sir Joseph Flavel in the 1920s. Corporate philanthropy today takes on many forms, even as a broadly encompassing corporate social responsibility strategy. For example, most of Canada's large banking institutions now have corporate foundations to share their largesse, with CIBC being the most recent to announce the creation of the CIBC Foundation just a few months ago. 
Today, environmental, social, and corporate governance, or ESG for short, is a hot topic in the business community as it is in society. ESG is an evaluation of a firm's collective conscientiousness for social and environmental factors. And it is increasingly being used by investors, bankers, and the like as a factor to consider in allocating their investment capital. For many large companies, shareholders themselves are demanding disclosures from management on the company's strategy on giving back to their communities and supporting them. But there are still opposing factions on this from a business strategy standpoint. Just this past week, the CEO of the world's largest asset manager, Larry Fink of BlackRock, triggered heated front page debate in the financial newspapers, including the Globe and Mail and, and the Financial Times of London, when he stated in his annual open letter that his firm will focus on the interests of society as well as on profits, what he calls stakeholder capitalism. He believes this is capitalist in that it is based on mutually beneficial relationships with employees, customers, suppliers, and communities. Our panel today will present and discuss the historical, contemporary, and future role of business and business leaders in the area of philanthropy. We are joined today by three fantastic individuals that spend a great deal of time researching and contemplating on the interplay of business and philanthropy. So let me very briefly introduce them, and then each will give a short 10-minute presentation on the topic. Patricia Hardy is the CEO of the Tunnelwood Group, a strategic planning and consulting firm located in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Patricia is the former director of development at the University of Winnipeg and served as the national campaign director of the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. She is the noted author, as we talked about earlier, of the book, A History of Philanthropy in Canada. And uh, I'm sure we will hear a lot of material from that book today. Stephen Iyer is the president of Common Good Strategies. Steve has deep experience in strategy and insights. He has worked in analytics, research, and marketing and sales roles in the charitable sector. He also has experience as a senior researcher for Imagine Canada, where he has authored numerous publications on social impact and revenue strategies for nonprofits. Most recently, he led the research and writing of Toronto's Vital Signs Report for the Toronto Foundation. Professor Charles Harvey is Professor of Business History and Management and Director of the Centre for Research on Entrepreneurship, Wealth and Philanthropy at the Newcastle University Business School. His current research interests include entrepreneurship and philanthropy, business elites, and historical organizational studies. And he has published extensively on these topics. So now that I've had the opportunity to introduce our speakers, let's let's ask them to uh, to contribute and uh, make their presentations. Perhaps I can ask Patricia Hardy to start things off. And Patricia, I'm just going to allow you to share your screen uh, so that um, you can present your presentation. Just one sec. I can figure this out. <laughs> I think I have to be a co-host. Yes, you have to be a co-host and I have to figure out now how, how do I do that? If you go in participants and find my name, I think then there's three to log. Okay. There we are. <laughs> I'm teaching on Zoom these days, so. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great, thank you. You should be able to share the screen now. Great, thank you very much. It's, um, I'm just um, delighted to be here. I was very, um, pleased with uh, when I got Mark's invitation, uh, because I have been retired for quite a while, and uh, nobody has really been all that interested in this old research. But um, um, so thank you very much for inviting me. I have to say, too, I'm quite delighted that you have such an organization. Um, I think I had not heard of it um, too much because I've been out of the field. So. Um, I certainly wish there'd been an organization such as the Canadian Business History Association back when I was doing my research in the late um, 1990s. Um, people weren't all that interested in philanthropy back then. Um, some of them didn't even think it should be called philanthropy. They thought it should be called uh, charity. So um, it's quite um, nice to hear all of you talk about how important it is and how people are interested in it. I'm just going to give a quick presentation, um, talk about what prompted the research, how I approached it, 
And what I found, and this is 1997 to 1999, so um, some, you know, there may be more recent things that many of you know of, but um, the reason I started this research was I was going to an American university, a master's program in philanthropy and development. Uh, we didn't have any programs in Canada then. As a matter of fact, I don't think we still have one. But um, so they gave us a textbook called American Philanthropy. And there were three Canadians in the class. And I asked, where's the Canadian philanthropy book? And they said, if you, um, you know, if you can find one, we'd be very happy to, um, to use it. And I thought, oh, that's great. Well, anyway, of course, I did a search, couldn't find anything. Um, and at that time, Kathleen Kelly uh, had written really the very first um, tomb on fundraising called Effective Fundraising Management. And she argued that fundraising could not be a profession if we don't have our own body of knowledge. So I kind of saw an opportunity for me to contribute to the body of knowledge for Canadian philanthropy. Um, little did I know what I was getting into. Um, Anyway, I took um, sort of a, a three-pronged approach. I'm not going to bore you with the methodology and the um, research results, although some of the historians might prefer that. Um, I did a literature search, um, and I was fortunate that I was working at the University of Winnipeg then, so the interlibrary loans were um, very useful. It gave me a much broader um, scope than I would have had had I not been uh, working at a university. Uh, I also did a survey of historians and fundraisers, and out of that, I chose um, people to do key informant interviews. Um, the the real, um, really, the findings um, were that everybody I spoke to said there's not very much knowledge available. Many people said I don't know very much about philanthropy. But everyone said, yes, we do need a history of philanthropy in Canada that is separate from U.S. history. Uh, so there was an interest in the idea, but not very much had been um, written about or explored at that time. So I'm just going to give you um, a short sort of chronological historical summary. Um, the summary that I made is really from the literature search Anything that could be tied to a date was kind of a way to start. Um, so, of course, um, the beginning was early philanthropy, right? We had our indigenous traditions of reciprocity and the honor of giving. And there's, um, there's a great deal, a very rich history that um, we have. And, and I think, too, we hear these anecdotal stories of how indigenous people helped explorers and settlers. But... Their, their tradition of philanthropy was much um, richer than, than just helping out the newcomers. Then we had the French traditions in the 1600s when the French crown gave money to the Catholic Church in Canada who then delivered aid to the settlers. Um, so that was um, not so much different than what happens in France now, I think. In 1759, when the English uh, defeated the French, People had quite an abrupt change because England said, we're not going to give you any money, we're not going to give your churches any money, you need to take care of yourselves or ask your own church, your local church to help. But uh, they soon realized, you know, another 40 or 50 years later, the English colonial government did start to subsidize um, church welfare organizations. Um, so again, we have government money going to churches to um, provide services. Also, in the 1800s, um, the colonial government in Canada imposed what we call the English Statue of Charitable Uses that had been um, brought into England in 1601. Um, sometimes Some people call it the Elizabethan Poor Laws, but the, um, the reason this was important to Canada is because this is what gave us our definition of charity and is actually still what is applied um, if someone's applying for to be charitable status today this is the still same definition um, 
because it was brought in by an act of parliament, it needs to be changed by an act of parliament. And nobody um, has really wanted to open that kettle of fish uh, because there's so many nonprofits and ch charities as well. But, um, and in the 1800s, again, we saw numerous societies and organizations sprang up outside of the churches. Mostly their mission was to help the needy. Um, and these organizations were, you know, maybe in taverns or tavern owners started groups, labor organizations, and of course, ethnic groups. As the waves of immigration came, they started, you know, the Irish benevolent, everyone had their own benevolent association. Um, also in the 1880s, James McGill, who was a fur trader and a merchant, gave his estate to a provincial commission for the purpose of endowing McGill University. Um, now, there is some controversy around whether it was a philanthropic intent or whether, whether he was trying to evade taxes, but that's, um, we prefer to think it was a philanthropic intent, and that's a discussion for another day. Um, in 1821, we saw the very first fundraising campaign that was aimed at individuals and businesses. And that campaign was to supplement a government startup grant that was given to the Montreal General Hospital. So, you know, um, at the time I did my research, that was all I could find out about the first one. So, in the mid 1800s, with the rise of the social gospel movement, um, in the United States, we saw wealthy social gospelers sort of using their wealth to establish their own institutions, sometimes named after themselves. But in Canada, we saw um, wealthy people and business owners tending to donate money to their churches, so then the church decided what was good for the community. So quite a difference between um, the U.S. and Canada. In 1920s, we started to see the organization of philanthropy and um, there were so many appeals. P businesses were getting very tired of everyone coming to ask. So business and labor, of course, developed a partnership to establish federated campaigns, which were some community chess and then later the United Ways. Um, in 1921, the first community foundation, the Winnipeg Foundation, was established by, yes, William Alloway, a banker who made a gift of $100,000. Um, in the 1930s, we started seeing more foundations. Uh, the second community foundation started in 1934 uh, in Vancouver. And we also saw um, a family foundation, the McConnell Family Foundation was started. Um, Something that was important for individuals was the 1936 Income Tax Act that um, allowed charitable donations to be a deduction for people when they were computing their personal income tax. So that was kind of an incentive for people to make personal gifts. Um, we continued to see in the 40s and 50s many, many um, family foundations established. Um, mostly family foundations and not corporate foundations at that point in time. Um, and in the 1960s, again, more, uh, many more, another 18 family foundations incorporated. And in 1966, we saw the minister, the government wanted charities to begin filing returns, right? They wanted them to be registered so the tax receipts they issued could be checked. They wanted to make sure that if I was saying I was giving money to a charity, then they wanted to have a way to check it. So that was the, part of the purpose for that. Um, at that time too, people who owned smaller business or medium-sized businesses often were making personal donations because the tax um, benefits were a little bit, or the tax was a little bit better than, than um, corporate giving. In the 1970s, um, when Lotto Quebec was established in 1970, that was really the first um, gam organization that was set up to use gambling revenue to support health and social service sectors. After that, it spread much wider. And we also saw business sponsorships, right, of, of um, gambling events, casinos, 
bingos, that sort of, that sort of thing. And um, in 1974, we saw the Council for Business and the Arts established, and that was CEOs from 50 corporations. And the idea was that the, the council was going to act as a re central resource for business involvement in the arts. Um, so kind of a formal um, setup. In the 1980s, um, as we all know, there was quite a great decrease in government financing of health care, social services, and universities. So that led to an increased number of charities because people wanted, to, organizations wanted to be able to raise their own money. Also an increase in philanthropic fundraising and a movement away from businesses giving only to the United Way. Um, Prior to that, there was, I know it depended on the city, but in some cities, um, businesses were encouraged to make their donations through the United Way and not um, outside that. Um, but because health organizations weren't part of the United Way, so they started making separate appeals to business. And we saw hospital foundations, certainly some were established earlier, but in the late 1980s, more and more hospital foundations started to be established as the fundraising arm for hospitals. Um, we also saw in the late 80s and 1990s, many businesses started hiring fundraisers because they needed help to deal with the, all of the asks that were coming in. There were just so many um, organizations asking for money. Um, and you know, in the early days, um, CEOs had a lot of influence on giving. The asks usually went to them. Uh, in the late 1980s, we started to see changes. Um, businesses started to develop their own giving policies and their own sometimes employee committees or charitable giving committees, uh, which I guess was the precursor to setting up their own foundations. Um, so CEO influence declined a little bit, you know, used to be great if you knew the head of the bank, you could go in and try and get a donation from the bank. But um, as they started to formalize their own giving, that kind of influence um, sometimes declined. We also saw businesses start to channel giving, some, some giving through their marketing budget. So in addition to philanthropic giving, there was, they were all also supporting charities um, by supporting events and through marketing budgets. Um, so really, you know, the um, history of Canadian philanthropy lies really within a complex narrative about the symbiotic relationships between government, churches, individuals, and businesses. And, um, you know, this research is, as I said, from 1997 to 1999. Um, there was a publisher interested in the book, but I did not pursue the research. Um, for one thing, I was not associated as faculty or um, academically with the university. I was busy with my own business and my own family, um, so I just didn't have time to do the research. But um, we did in 2014, um, as Mark mentioned, we did publish um, two volumes of Excellence in Fundraising, and in Volume 2 there is a chapter about... Um, history of philanthropy in Canada, but really I was, um, we were recommending that can we encourage businesses to start writing their own history <laughs> so that we have a bit more resources um, for which to, to look at the history of um, philanthropy and businesses. Um, now it's 20 years later, um, people are far more aware of what philanthropy is, uh, there's more resources, and um, I think our next panelist is going to tell us a little bit more about more contemporary times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. That is absolutely fascinating. Um, and I think you may have to make me as the host again. Oh, okay. Yes, I can, oh, I I can do it. No, I can, I can do it. I've done it. You Thank you. It. Okay. Some <laughs> no worries. Some people were coming into the meeting and I was letting them in. I hope that was okay. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Patricia. That's absolutely fascinating. You gave us a truly a, an amazing historical picture there and a timeline that we can follow in 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 uh, business 
the relationship between business and philanthropy in Canada. Let's now turn a little bit to the academic research um, that's been done and some insight there. And I know Professor Harvey, you are uh, certainly our resident expert today on that. Can we ask you to sort of uh, broach the subject of, um, of the academic and research side of things of business and philanthropy? So I hope you can all hear me and thank you so much for inviting me to say a few things. It's late at night here, uh, after 10 o'clock and after my bedtime. So if I begin to flag, you'll know why, but I will try and keep going. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about the past, present, future of elite philanthropy. And just as a rough guide, think of elite philanthropy as a million dollars or more regular type giving. That's really what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to make some introductory observations on that topic. As I speak, I really, to state my credentials as it were, they are one, I've done an awful lot of reading on the topic, I guess, I suppose that's something. And the other, I've got two research projects which are quite deep. One is on the Northeast of England, uh, an area that was a bit of a Silicon Valley in Britain between 1830 and 1939. And I'm really studying in depth all the givers, all the beneficiaries, all the gifts, everything that passed through the system. And we're compiling a large database on that. And just to give you some idea, we've got over 2000 donors that we're tracking. And some of these, of course, made many, many very large gifts indeed. And the second is I'm engaged in something, an elaborate exercise, recoding all the million dollar gifts made in the United States between 2000 and 2014. Truly philanthropic gifts in that database were 70,000 gifts, ranging from a million dollars, obviously, at the base to 30 million at the top, which is, of course, Warren Buffet to the Gates Foundation. And what I'm trying to do is to establish how money flows across the system and how the philanthropic system works as an institution. That's the nature of that project. These two projects are closely related in my mind, but probably in nobody else's. And what I'm going to speak about really is a summary of a, some of the arguments made in an article in the International Journal of Management Reviews 2021, which is a theory type paper, and then a very historical type paper in the Business History Review in 2019. So I'm going to do it as past, present and future. And the first thing really to say is that the origins of the contemporary system of philanthropy as an institution are indeed ancient. So our work on the Northeast stretches back to 1100. That's the point at which the North of England was conquered finally and subdued by William the Conqueror. And with the conquest, of course, came the distribution of land and with the distribution of land came churches and monasteries, nunneries and so on in their wake. And if you think about the words philanthropy, charitable organizations, endowed funds, and then the beneficiaries, these are all words which have been in use for a very long time. And we can think about this, for example, as the land is conquered, revenue is generated when you endow an institution, say a church or a monastery, with a parcel of land. In other words, meaning a number of farms. And these farms have a rent roll. And this system of rent roll philanthropy endures right through to the 19th century and beyond. And in fact, some of our uh, organizations date right back to the 12th century. Sherburne House Hospital is notable amongst these, still collecting rents from the same endowed lands, right back from 1181, when these lands were endowed by the great grandson of William the Conqueror. And of course, you then see waves in philanthropy using the basic model that was established very early on. So it grows out from uh, churches and religious giving into uh, grammar schools initially associated with uh, 
with the, the cathedrals, the great cathedrals, and then into elementary type schools, and then into other forms of welfare provision, and from welfare provision into parks and gardens in the 19th century on a big scale, and then cultural pursuits like art galleries and so on. But the basic model being extended and developed, and then in the 19th century, the addition of something called subscription philanthropy, which I'll come on to. But my basic point is that the basic system of philanthropy was well in place by the 17th century. By then, we had permanent intermediary fund holders, foundations, supporting multiple charitable organizations and so on. And in Britain, we have something called the Henry Smith Charity. And that's really our oldest uh, permanent foundation, still with us today, still making large and significant grants, amount of grant making per year, uh, dating back to 1628. In the Northeast, our oldest is Lord Cruz Charity, which is from 1721. Uh, he was a cleric. I'll not go into the details of any of these. But subscription philanthropy is the big innovation, of course, really, of the late 18th and 19th century. And this is when people come together and collectively subscribe to a list for a cause to create a charity. It may be a hospital, for example. And you may subscribe at that point to creating, uh, to building the place. And then once you've built the hospital or uh, the maternity home or whatever it might be, you then at that point uh, begin to, uh, uh, to permanently subscribe uh, in order to keep the institution going and alive. And that's, of course, how most of the hospitals in Britain, before the workhouse hospitals, actually came into being. And as late as 19, uh, when the National Health Service came into being, about half the hospitals were still of that subscription type. And they were often the very best hospitals uh, in Britain. So this later systematic domination of philanthropy by foundations is a relatively recent thing. You, of course, know that uh, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and so on, Ford later, are really late 19th, early 20th century uh, uh, developments. And then that movement blossoms in the 20th century and the mega foundations of today come into being, displacing effectively subscription philanthropy which had been the primary model of the industrializing era. So what I'm trying to say really is that the deep roots of philanthropy, what the past gives us is not just large accumulations of funds which are handed down. These are important, of course, the past remains important to the present, just as Henry Smith and Lord Crewe remain important. But the past has also bequeathed us a systemic way of thinking about philanthropy, which I've tried to capture in this diagram. And if you think about this diagram, you can think, what do I do as a donor, whether I'm a corporation, whether I'm an individual? Well, I may give directly to a beneficiary. If I give directly to a beneficiary, the beneficiary has got one of three choices, or I have three choices with the beneficiary, one to fund activities, two to fund infrastructure, buildings or equipment or whatever, or three, to store up that uh, capital as a reserve. So if you think of beneficiary, sorry. I suspect I've gone. No, no, you're still here, yeah. Am I still with you? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, sorry, Mark, I, I uh, let me just try and restore myself then to the full screen. Um, go back the other way. So the big endowments of Harvard, for example, the 30 plus billion that we've got tucked away are in what I'm describing here as beneficiary endowments. A donor, of course, can also give to a fund holder, to an intermediary like a community foundation, a donor advice fund, a supporting foundation, as we were hearing uh, earlier from Pat, or they may put cash away into fund holder endowments. So there we might think of Bill Gates. Historically in the Northeast, I might be thinking of the Lord Crew Foundation 
or any one of a number of other foundations that were created. And this money flows through the system, partly as stock and partly as flow. This is important, this, because this system is a long creation. It's the institution of philanthropy, and there are many, many rules governing conduct and behavior formally and informally within the system. And we heard there from Pat about the 1601 uh, Elizabethan laws, uh, which are really the beginning of codification in a serious way uh, from an Anglo-Canadian perspective. Just a few observations on philanthropy present then. Elite philanthropy, historically contemporaneously, is enabled by extreme inequalities of wealth. We can't avoid that. Philanthropy is born of an inherently undesirable situation of a lot of people who are poor and some people who are very wealthy being able to give. It's institutionally embedded and governed by norms, rules, and practices. This is the whole mode of conduct. The post-1980 surge in income and wealth inequalities, identified really with neoliberalism, globalization, has propelled elite philanthropy center stage and current debates about democracy, social inclusion, and social justice. Philanthropy, elite philanthropy, is not democratic. Elite philanthropists predominantly give to elite institutions. That's an interesting uh, observation. They give, if you were to say in order what the causes are, higher education is number one. Health is number two. Health research, broadly defined as health research, scientific research, and so on, is a surprising number three. Culture and heritage come down. Community services probably come in sort of lower middle. It's a very interesting pattern of observation, but the dominant institution or relationship in elite philanthropy is between wealthy people, foundations, and higher education institutions. I can say more about that, but of the 70,000 major gifts in the uh, giving list, 20,000 are to higher education, just to give you some idea. 10,000 are to research or health or science or whatever. And I won't bore you with all the figures because these are mega billions we're talking about in the US. Post 2000, the large increase in fund holder and beneficiary endowments has really occurred and it's big time, you can see this. So if you're a university, what you're selling is positions, chairs, when you, and there's a, not, a, not exactly a price for this, but in the US, it would be about 1.5 million to end our chair. Scholarships are another big fund uh, for a relatively modest givers. And then it works up through programs, centers, institutions, business schools, and then at the very top to entire institutions like the Broad, uh, Broad Foundation and the Broad Institute. So these are important trends and they are so powerful because of the extremity of inequality. And it's no surprise therefore that you see Silicon Valley as dominant, uh, New York finance, very important, Texan wealth from oil and from other areas is important and so on. There are doubtless positive redistributive effects from these activities and socially disadvantaged people do benefit but systemically philanthropy favors elitism and elite institutions, which can be argued to promote rather than diminish inequalities. And that's a debate we might have later. So just some observations on the future then from my take. Institutional embeddedness and strong inertial tendencies emphasize continuity. Predominantly, I think we're going to see more of the same, okay? Predominant. We will remain for the foreseeable future far removed from the ideal of effective philanthropy. So think of Peter Singer's utilitarian ethical idea, which is basically the money does the most good for those who need it the most. This, of course, says you give to poor people and predominantly to poor people in poor countries. 
and that this redistributive effect will have the greatest benefit for the greatest number, you know, just quoting, going back to Bentham and so on. So we are far removed from that situation. That is not the way the philanthropic world is ordered. Philanthropy, therefore, will continue to amplify the legitimacy and voice of philanthropists who endeavor to forge the rules of the game. And in our own research, for example, if you try to reform the tax laws in Britain on giving, it's called gift aid in Britain, is the way tax relief is given, all hell will break loose as it did when Chancellor George Osborne tried to do that. And basically what happens is you'll get a confederation of philanthropists and uh, charities who will join forces to shout down effectively any attempt to reform or make the uh, provision any less liberal. So we've got low taxation, tax rate, toleration of tax savings. These are all illustrative of uh, the power of capital, if you like, at the moment. So my concluding remarks, just quickly. Generous role models notwithstanding, the redistribution to potential of philanthropy historically has been limited by lack of meaningful participation by the majority of wealthy people. There are many, many generous givers, but there are many, many wealthy people who give nothing. And we know this, or next to nothing, we know this because of the tax situation and the tax take across the United States as a percentage has not risen. It's hard to get it above 2%, okay, across the class of wealthy people as a whole. This is a similar situation prevails in Britain where I've done a tracking exercise on the giving list as opposed to the rich list. And you can see that giving is not a predominant thing. A lot of people give very little. Philanthropy, however, can rightfully claim to have been at the cutting edge of numerous social innovations, creating potentialities for better futures for entire swathes of the population, especially during the golden age of voluntarism. And all our historical works point to philanthropy as an incredible and noble thing during that period. And it did so much for people and lifting entire societies. So my fear is that Wealthy people at the moment are dominating the system. Only a small part of the philanthropic funds stemming from globalization actually find their way to developing countries. The lion's share benefit the wealthiest countries and wealthy organizations within them. That should give us pause to thought. This is my conclusion. It should give us pause to thought. And that pause for thought is this is not an ethically sound position. Philanthropy is urgently in need of reinvention so that it achieves the kind of ambitious goals and leveling goals and uplifting goals that it consistently achieved during the 19th, mid 19th to mid 20th century. That's my conclusion. I doubtless get my head bitten off for that, but I look forward to it being chewed a little bit more, at least my ears chewed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Charles. Oh, my, my goodness, that's very, very fascinating research. Um, I'm I'm trying to get to, rid of this. Yes, I'm just going to uh, set myself back as to, the host. Yeah. You need, so I need to press stop share. Yes. Thank you. So thank you, Charles. I mean, fascinating research and uh, obviously a lot there to, to think about and to discuss. And I look forward to some discussion on that uh, very shortly. So um, let's uh, now turn to an expert in the trenches today on bringing business and philanthropy together. And that would be Stephen Ayers. So Stephen, could you uh, please take the floor and, and, and uh, give us uh, some of your knowledge? 
Yeah, thank you. So I'm uh, I'm not going to use slides, and I'll try to make it quick so we can leave some time for questions. Uh, but I also want to talk a little bit about some of the research I've been doing. I uh, first I wrote a significant report on corporate uh, community investment, corporate philanthropy in 2008, where we surveyed a broad swath of Canadian businesses as well as a subset of some of the largest businesses in the country. Uh, in 2018, I did another survey about 10 years later, uh, again looking at the largest business in the country. So I uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work we can compare looking at businesses that uh, represented about 10% of corporate giving in, in 2008 and about 10% of corporate giving in 2018 and talk about how that evolved over time. What was the same, what was different? Uh, I've also done uh, over the time period, a lot of interviews with corporate uh, philanthropy leaders and um, uh, private uh, philanthropists and can give some perspective on some of those changes. The first thing I want to start about is just a sense of how significant corporate philanthropy is within the broader ecosystem. So we don't have great data on exactly how much corporations give over time. Often when we look, uh, we rely a lot on data from uh, tax returns uh, from companies, which only captures a fraction of their, uh, their charitable contributions because they don't have any real incentive to capture this under, say, a charitable contribution versus a marketing line versus a sponsorship line. In 2003, um, the companies claimed about $1.3 billion on their tax returns as transfers to nonprofit serving households. In um, the same year, Imagine Canada did one of the largest studies of nonprofits uh, conducted to date, surveying more than 10,000, asking them detailed questions about their financial statements, and found that uh, nonprofits estimated that year that they received about twice as much money or uh, $2.8 billion from companies. And we look at the most recent data from Q3 2021. That number uh, in terms of claim donations went from 1.3 billion in 2003 to uh, 3. Uh, what the number was, uh, 3.3 billion in the most recent quarter on an annualized basis. So over that time, about 150% uh, increase in donations, like probably, you know, if we assume that same ratio might hold, we might expect around $7 billion donated from companies to nonprofits every year. I mean, it's with a pretty significant margin of error because there's a lot of limitations in that sample. The overall charitable sector in Canada has revenues in the $300 billion range. So this is a pretty significant uh, revenue stream, but compared to the largest, it is just a couple percentage. I mean, it rises uh, for certain sectors and becomes incredibly important in certain areas. Uh, but it, uh, in terms of an overall revenue stream, it is a relatively small one. When we compare to say individual giving, uh, in 2018, we saw about $20 billion in uh, donations, uh, uh, tax receipted gifts reported by Canadian charities. So it's sizable, but compared to some, several other revenue streams, it is one of the smaller ones. On that broader topic of elite wealth and transfers, I think that Charles was bringing up, uh, we've also seen some pretty significant shifts in terms of the foundation landscape, which we'll I'm not focus on too much. But in 2018, we saw that uh, foundations grant gave about $7 billion in uh, transfers to qualified donees. So basically giving the money from one charity to another charity, typically. Uh, that was up by about $3.5 billion uh, 10 years earlier. So about doubling over 10 years. Uh, assets went up from $35 billion in 2008 to $95 billion in uh, 2018. That surged even further during the pandemic. Uh, but I do want to focus on the corporate philanthropy side of things. So I led a significant research study surveying companies in 2018 and 2008, and it was pretty evident in both cases. Every, nearly every large company in this country we talked to uh, reported they were giving donations of cash to charitable organizations. Most of they were donating goods, most of they were donating products. That was the case in both 2008, it was the case in 2018. Pretty much everyone says it's just an expected part of doing business now. These were not necessarily the most representative samples. In both cases, they were came from the uh, membership of the uh, Business Council of Canada. Uh, it had a different name at the time, as well as Imagine Canada's caring companies. So they were self-selected. So this isn't necessarily representative of the entire uh, sample of large companies, but it is somewhat consistent over time in terms of where the group of, of uh, organizations who responded came from. And in both cases, again, they represent about 10% of corporate donations in the country. What we did start to see differences though was pretty stark were the professionalization and the strategic formalization of the function. So in 2008, we saw about 40% of companies said they had formal written policies around charitable giving, which if anyone who is involved with fundraising now, it's almost mind blowing that the majority of large businesses um, and I find large is more than 25 million in annual revenue, like did not have 
formal policies even a bit more than 10 years ago. When we surveyed them again in 2018, it was 90% of them had a formal policy for what they were giving to. You know, that might invade what geographic areas they're going to give to, what causes they're going to give to, how someone applies. It's, I mean, that shift over 10 years, and again, it is a slightly biased sample, so we, you know, should interpret with caution, but it really highlights, I mean, some of the companies that so when you go through the raw data and see who said they did not have formal policies 10 years ago is somewhat stunning. And I think this formalization, more so than anything else, uh, is the big shift to me over that 10 year period. And so we ask a, a lot of these folks what they saw as the biggest change in corporate philanthropy over 10 years. And the number one thing they saw is they, they said was they became more focused. The number two thing, out of 65% of people who completed that question said that the biggest change they saw was increased focus. The second was increased strategic emphasis. So 40% of people who answered that question mentioned something about strategy and an open-ended question. And the third was about partnerships. And it should be unsurprising for people going from, hey, we're just giving money, typically because the CEO asked, I think like uh, Patricia was uh, talking about, uh, to a formal function saying, here's what we're giving to, here's why we're giving it. Uh, it shouldn't be surprising that that caused a lot of focus, uh, increased focus. Uh, so mean that fewer organizations were receiving funds, but often they were receiving a larger amount of money from the corporation. So they were getting more strategic about what they wanted to give to, and that resulted in larger gifts and deeper partnerships. The other thing I think is, that was a big shift is this ongoing focus on strategy. And I will say like, when I did work in 2018, when I did work in 2018, uh, 2008, when I read some of the reports on, you know, giving advice to uh, corporate philanthropists in two, 1972, like everyone was talking about how there's a, it's, things are getting more strategic, things are getting more sophisticated. I mean, it's an ongoing trend that likely will not stop, but there's this on, and it is definitely increasing over time. And I think, you know, when we see this emphasis, it does have some uh, major changes. Um, I think we're, I just want to leave a bit of time. So I, will, I just want to talk about what we saw most recently. Um, so, it, you know, and I'll give one more or two more minutes just talking about summarizing and then so leaving some time for questions. Uh, we had, we did a research, we did research studies uh, during the pandemic, uh, since the onset of the pandemic. And I think well, we talked to a lot of the uh, corporate uh, philanthropy managers ranging from lower level staff to the most senior staff, asking about what they saw, how they were reacting to the pandemic. Uh, we talked to them in summer 2020, talked to more again in uh, summer 2021, and published reports on each. And I think what was really striking to folks was, you know, the folks who manage corporate philanthropy at large companies typically are very socially minded people. And I think like what they had really seen is they saw these trends about inequality, they'd seen many of the things that, you know, the growing challenges, you know, these not making the progress they were looking for in the decade prior. Um, and I think a lot of folks were disappointed in what they had achieved. And then the pandemic added on, they looked at the things like the youth programs they'd been funding for decades, so in some cases, the mental health programs, you know, the health care funding they'd done. And I think it was a great sense of disappointment in terms of they hadn't been achieving what they'd been hoping to. And on top of that, they saw so much regression in a lot of the social issues that they cared very deeply about. And, you know, while the whether there's the debate, whether the companies care very deeply about the causes, I'd say by and large, from my opinion, the folks who are managing the funds and distributing the funds, you know, almost entirely care very deeply about the causes they're contributing to. Um, and so I think like, you know, what we heard from the folks we interviewed was, you know, they are trying to look at do, think, doing things differently and, you know, going forward, you know, I think the last, 20 years, there was this great emphasis on strategic philanthropy. And for the first time, I think in the conversations I've been having in the last year, there's this talk about trust-based philanthropy. Strategic philanthropy, you know, really is emphasizing metrics, you know, tie in with business value. A lot of the things that are trust-based philanthropy is, can you trust the folks you're giving money to? Do you let them use the money for whatever you want, as opposed to telling them exactly how the funds are going to be used? I think, you know, for the first time, I think for some of the folks we've talked to, there is the sense of how do we share some of the power and I don't think, you know, in any of its work I've done in the previous decade, there was any true sense of that. Uh, the other thing I think is really uh, notable, uh, and just to wrap this up, is the increased focus on uh, equity, uh, funding Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, organizations led in serving those folks. I think a lot of the folks I talked to had absolutely no clue how much money they were giving to those causes, 
they are increasingly trying to investigate internally where, where their funds are going, you know, how they're doing and setting more targets for themselves. A lot of folks joined the Black North Initiative, an initiative where they signed on to promise to give 3.5% of corporate contributions to Black uh, led organization, which matches the percentage of uh, black led and black serving organizations, uh, ranging for both corporate philanthropy and sponsorship. And I think like a lot of people are like, oh crap, we have no idea whatsoever what we're doing. And we've made a commitment for 2025 to meet it. So they are sort of investigating all sorts of stuff they never looked at before. So I think like, you know, there, uh, I have a bunch of other points, but I think it's already 555. So I'll stop and uh, there we go. Well, that's, that's terrific, Stephen. Again, fascinating information. Maybe I'll, I'll start with a question to the panel. Um, it seems that there is a bit of a difference here, a stark difference between corporate giving, business giving, and business individual giving. Um, uh, Charles, you talk frame that in the sort of elitist context. And, um, and Stephen, you talk about the sort of professionalization of the business enterprise in terms of the form of the giving. And, and, and uh, Patricia, you mentioned that as well. Can you comment a little bit further on that? Is, is individual business giving driven more by ego or as opposed to the, de the desire to tackle a particular problem in society? Whereas perhaps corporate giving is focused more on solving that particular problem and less on the prestige and reputation of the end of the business itself. The one thing I would add, and I had this in my more detailed notes, was the incredible rise of sponsorship uh, amongst the companies themselves. I think we saw about half of companies in 2008 said that they were engaged in sponsoring of nonprofits. That was up to uh, more than 90% by 2018. And I think that that sponsorship a lot of those related things are very much the company trying to gain business benefits from what they're doing. I think they're, you know, definitely there's a whole piece to it around the companies trying to, you know, leverage business benefits, trying to achieve, I guess, synergy between where there's community benefit as well as business benefit. I do, you know, the ego side, I'm, I'd be very curious to hear Charles or uh, perspective, but like that's, uh, I did want to add quickly on the sponsorship side. Charles, do you have any comments on the sort of ego? Driven? Yeah. Okay. It's a complex issue, isn't it? And it's very hard to generalize. My feeling about what happens to uh, wealthy people when they give, those who have a disposition to give, as they journey into philanthropy, become more and more committed to it. Very wealthy people see very little point in having oodles of money doing nothing. Okay, they've got oodles of money. The marginal value of retaining to them is near zero. Whereas the joy they get from actually participating in philanthropy is very great. And that joy increases and their identification with cause increases with time as a result of positive feedback loops. So if you look at giving patterns over time, People begin small, relatively. They then increase the scale of their gifts. And towards the end of their lives, they're into the process of making big, transformational, very serious investments of their wealth. So I don't think that's a cynical process at all. And of course, there are positive, you know, in terms of status and feedback and all the uh, symbolic benefits you begin from being seen as a generous donor. Yes, you get all those. And there's a big feel-good factor. But I don't think that's the predominant driver per se. But it is what, say, the universities are so skilled at. If I was a fundraiser in a university, and Patricia's been one, and Stephen knows about it, and Stephen's written about identity and marketing, and uh, he's very conscious of these things, then what I would say is, if you look at the American model, the fundraisers in top American universities are remarkably skilled people. And what they're remarkably skilled at doing is building the identification of the donor with their institution, with the cause, with the worthiness of it. And they're brilliant at building commitment. And that goes for relatively modest donors and very large donors as well. Um, so, no, I don't think it's a cynical process. I think it's, a, it's an interesting process, very, very interesting process. And for companies, um, again, I think it's a very uh, varied thing. 
a lot of them still give to the United Ways, as uh, Pat was describing, they still do that. And they do it because they're identifying with a local community. And they're saying, we do business here, we want to give back here. So that's the attraction of community foundations as a vehicle for corporates as well, and United Ways uh, and so on. So um, they're really identifying with the communities that they are part of. That's that's my take on it. Patricia, I think you had a comment there as well that you wanted to throw in. Um, I, I actually, I wanted to comment on a couple of the things that Charles said in his presentation, a, a little bit off the <laughs> original thing, but um, I was fascinated to hear about this elitist, um, you know, the Winnipeg Foundation has always worked very hard to talk about not being just for wealthy people to give. They've talked about everyday philanthropists. And that's why they talk so much about, you know, the first gift from Alloway was $100,000. The second gift was the widow's mite was $10. So they want to try and talk about, you know, everybody having the capacity to give. And actually in Canada, um, people with lower income give a higher percent of their income. And uh, I mean, that probably is the same in Britain and the United <laughs> States as well. But, you know, so Charles, your comment about, you know, there's many wealthy people who do not participate in philanthropy is certainly true. And I was also interested when you're saying your comment about it's not ethically sound, because, you know, there are many people that would argue that um, wealthy people giving money is a form of social control so that they can make the communities do what they think should be done. And... Uh, I remember there was um, a very well-known philanthropist in Winnipeg, which I won't say because you'll all know, but she used to talk about, oh, you know, there are people who are lifters up and others who need to be lifted up. And one day somebody turned to me and they said, my God, how paternalistic that is. And it's something that we don't always talk about is the paternalism, the paternalistic nature of wealthy people and also the fact that it is a slight form of social control. So I was very interested in your, in your comments about how unethically sound it is. So thanks, and, Mark. And, thank you. And Lindsay, I believe you had a comment as well. Uh, yes. Uh, Lindsay, you're on mute. Um, I've unmuted. Can you hear me? Uh, you're fine now, yeah. Uh, yes, I worked at TD Bank in the early 80s, and I think they were one of the first major institutions that had a professional approach to philanthropy. They, they dealt uh, with donations in a separate department. And at that time, they were not into sponsorships. They made donations. Of course, flash forward to now, and you see TD Bank sponsoring a lot of causes, the Jazz Festival and many others. And I, I agree with Stephen that um, many organizations have switched to sponsorships. Which leads me to my question. Uh, Pat mentioned philanthropists who are a bit paternalistic and are they influencing people? We see a lot of universities and hospitals uh, being uh, overtly sponsored by corporations and individuals. Um, and it may be totally above board, but is there a, a slight chance that their, their sponsorships could influence academic scholarship or research or perceived. Would you, would you like me to have a go or Stephen seems to be? Uh, Stephen, why don't you comment first and then we'll go back to George. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I do research from uh, the, uh, through a, a charity that uh, receives a lot of funds from corporations and I can't speak on their behalf, but I do think, you know, um, you know, when, when revenue from companies is a significant portion of your, your income, it's going to inevitably, you know, change how you, you do work. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily, uh, you know, it's not even intentional sometimes. You're just, just sometimes you're writing a sentence and you're like, how would the funder think about that? I mean, it's, it's really hard not to. Um, and I think, you know, the more substantial portion of your revenue, the less secure that relationship is, the less trust there is, the more you're going to be wondering, but you write something, how is someone going to react? And I think, you know, it's, it's inevitable. I think, you know, for the most part, most researchers, you know, we're trying our best, but it's, you know, you can't have that hanging over you without having it in some ways influence the way you approach the work. 
And I mean, I speak, you know, I think for the most part, you know, we, we try to do our best, but like, it's a, you know, it's always there. And I think this is the ongoing power dynamic between any company that funds anything and those who receive the funds is there is a, a power imbalance. People want that relationship to continue. They want that funds to grow. And I do think, you know, we, as much as everyone does their best, you're going to inevitably, you know, be influenced by who pays the bills. And I think like maybe a little bit less so in academia, but I think it's, you know, I, I talk to a lot of folks who do research, who do fundraising, who do all this sort of, you know, executive directors. And, you know, it's a constant theme is when you receive money from any of these sorts of things, it changes a little bit and hopefully as little as possible, how you approach them. Charles, you, uh, you were going to say something as well? well? Well, I agree with that. And I think that's a judicious answer. And anybody who's in fundraising knows you've got to suck it up quite a lot. OK, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, but my concern is not with um, being dominated by donors. My concern is collusion amongst elites, okay? And that's a completely different point. So by that, I mean, if we take, say, the universities of Oxford and Cambridge in the UK, that's two universities. Now, we've got 160 effective universities. But those two universities have got 90% of the endowment, okay, of all universities, 90% on their own. It gives them a tremendous advantage in the system, the power of that cash. It may only be 20% of their turnover, but de facto it's free money. And they can plow that into, you know, boosting uh, the kind of people they employ, top talent, top students, and so on. They create the conditions in which their alumni are very keen to give back. So they give back eight times as much as alumni of their Russell Group competitors. That's the next strata down in the system. Still excellent universities, but the next strata down. Eight times as much. What you're seeing is elitism at work, elites favoring elite institutions, whereas the big problems in society are not in Oxford and Cambridge. The big problems in society are in the depressed zones where people have lost hope in life and have been crushed by globalization. Now, their employment has been crushed. Their sense of aspiration for their children has been crushed. So these are the things, these kinds of social disadvantages are the things that were taken on and embraced by earlier generations of philanthropists as the guide. But at the moment, the domination of giving into the hands of elites working with elites, we only give to the best, we favor the best institutions and so on. There's a logic to it, but it's a logic that ultimately is a wrong headed logic from an ethical standpoint. It's good if you're a philanthropist because where are you gonna to give to if you're gonna fund research? You wanna give it to the best research places, don't you? You know, that's a natural impulse. You give it to the best university. You identify with the best. You're creating the best science. You know, you're solving all these problems of disease. You're going to crack dementia. You're going to crack this. You're going to crack that. So I see the logic. I see the impulse. But it's a bit headlong and it's overdone. That's my point. Again, what a fantastic uh... Um, conversation here. This could just go on for hours and on, on end, and new new sort of revolution revelations come come forth and brought to the table. Unfortunately, we are out of time. That uh, we did only allocate one hour for this. I, I can't thank the three of you enough. Uh, you you the insights you brought to the table, the discussion, the future research that's going to come out of all of this, and the changes that are happening uh, in the field. Um, the relationship between the two is just mind boggling and. Uh, I'm glad we have people like you sort of helping us understand it and but also helping guide us uh, in in, um, in our thought processes around the whole issue so thank you uh, thank all three of you very very much um, and thank you for our audience of course for for paying attention and attending today and we're very grateful from that for that and of course thank you to national bank financial speaking of sponsorship for being such a great sponsor of these series and allowing us to bring such great minds together as this. Um, and with that, I will call a conclusion. We will be having our next um, talk uh, in February, so stay tuned for that. 
And I'm sure it will be just as fascinating as this one on another topic. Thank you all for joining us and, and have a great evening. Thanks very Thank much. You, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you to Thank the you. presenters. Thanks, Thanks to everybody for coming.